Well, our next presenter um, is Dr. Gao. And you know, loneliness can increase vulnerability. And the question that she will address is, can comprehensive advanced planning mitigate loneliness? Dr. Gao is associate professor with the University of California at San Francisco. We've had invaders today of our speakers from California. Aren't we lucky? Um, she is board certified in geriatrics and hospice and palliative medicine. During her time at UCSF, she served as medical director of the geriatric clinical services and she arranged a partnership between UCSF Geriatrics and the Over 60 Health Center in Berkeley. And she expanded the university's house call program. She has also developed several other clinical programs, including Bridges Home-Based home Palliative Care, Care Support Care Management for Patients with Complex Medical and Social Needs and the Medical Legal Partnership for Seniors, which is a collaborative clinic with medical and legal services providers to address the, need, the legal needs of older adults. Now, we are really fortunate because although she started in California, guess where she's at now? In Corvallis, Oregon. And she moved to Cor Corvallis last year and now serves as the medical director of clinical innovations for Benton Hospice Service. I was thrilled when I read this on the, her biography because I was a founding member of Benton Hospice Service a few decades ago. So I am thrilled to introduce Dr. Helen Gao. All right, um, so yes, I, am, I can now call Oregon my home state, which is absolutely fabulous. <laughs> and I have come to enjoy watching uh, Beavers women's basketball, yay. <laughs> so, all right, um, so I, I'm really delighted to be here talking after Carla and uh, Patrick, who I know very well from San Francisco, and I was thrilled that we could all kind of be together for this event here in Oregon, um, which seemed sort of funny to me given that I moved here um, and, and I'm now doing this event with them. <laughs> um, so um, I'm going to talk about over the next hour sort of advanced care planning um, and the intersection with loneliness. Now, um, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose, and that's a habit I always say given that we do a lot of academic talks. Um, and what I want to start with is um, actually a story about a patient that I saw both during my residency and then later when I was um, actually serving as a non-trainee provider at UC San Francisco. So when I was a resident, um, I took care of a woman who was in her 70s who you know, had some chronic illnesses but otherwise was fairly functional. And as a resident, as Carla has alluded to, you know, we don't learn a whole lot in our medical training um, about things that you would think are important to older adult care, uh, things such as identifying loneliness. Um, but the other thing that we didn't learn very much about was, you know, should we be talking about advanced care planning? You know, a big focus of our training was CPR or no CPR um, and asking about advanced healthcare directives, but I really had no idea what that meant uh, during my residency. So even though I took care of this woman for a year, um, I never asked her if she had an advanced healthcare directive. I never broached the topic. Um, she seemed relatively healthy, and so it never even crossed my mind. I left my residency, I left that clinic, um, and fast forward five years, and um, she comes to my geriatrics practice, uh, where I'm now a provider, and she has had a major catastrophic stroke where she cannot move, she's largely nonverbal, um, can sort of mumble and make nonsensical words, um, and uh, it hit me when she walked through the door and came in with two women who I had never met before that I had never asked her about uh, who was going to represent her if she lost her ability to communicate. Um, and I'll tell you the rest of the story um, later in my, in my talk. So um, 
for those of you who like you know, good journalism and, and op-eds, the New York Times has had some really fabulous uh, stories about loneliness and about advanced care planning. And so I've sprinkled throughout my talk some uh, artwork as well as the references to those articles uh, in my talk so that you can read them yourself. This is one that came out uh, last year uh, specifically about loneliness, and I think this is the one that references uh, our uh, Carla. So, all right, so why advanced care planning? Why are we talking about advanced care planning in a symposia that is largely focused on loneliness? And as you just heard from Carla, loneliness uh, increases functional impairment and uh, the rate of death amongst individuals who uh, perceive loneliness compared to those who don't. And what I would say is that these particular issues in terms of the loss of functional uh, independence, so disability, as well as death, are both core to the purpose of advanced care planning. In fact, the loss of cognitive capacity um, is what triggers an advanced care planning uh, document, um, which is why this is so important. These are my objectives, um, which are fourfold. First, to really describe the state of advanced care planning in the United States. And then to really define what comprehensive advanced care planning means um, and what uh, my colleagues in the um, elder law um, community that I've been collaborating with and I uh, talk about when we refer to comprehensive advanced care planning. I'd like to talk about the intersection between advanced care planning and loneliness, specifically with regard to vulnerabilities around healthcare decision making, and also vulnerabilities about someone's risk for uh, being a victim of abuse and exploitation. And then finally, talk a little bit about the care of unbefriended, or, or what I refer to as unrepresented adults. And I'll um, discuss that in relation to Oregon specifically. So before I move on to the state of advanced care planning, I would like all of you to close your eyes and raise your hand if you have yourself a completed advanced health care directive. Okay, and go ahead and put your hands down. And now raise your hand if you have a power of attorney document or some other document, sometimes these are included in living wills, uh, that identifies someone to manage your estate affairs and finances. Okay, and you can put your hands down. And the last question is, uh, which of you who raised your hands have both? Okay. All right, you can all open your eyes. This is another fabulous uh, article from the New York Times, how, is, how social isolation is killing us. Um, so I won't go into the specific numbers of those of you who raised your hands, um, but given that we are an audience full of people who clearly have an affinity for older adult issues and older adult care, um, I will say that it was less than half of you who have an advanced healthcare directive Fewer than that who have some type of a power of attorney or document to appoint someone to manage your finances and estate affairs, and a very small number of you who have both. In 2014, uh, the Institute on Medicine came out with this report, Dying in America. And in this report, um, they detailed the current state of advanced care planning in the United States. What they described is that advanced care planning uh, tends to be reactive, meaning that it tends to come up in discussions really when someone has become very sick or has started to lose uh, some amount of their capacity. It tends to be very fragmented, and this is not surprising given that our healthcare system is quite fragmented. You know, someone is in the hospital, bounces out of the hospital, maybe sees their primary care provider for 15 minutes, maybe their primary care provider moves on and they get another provider um, or they're in and out of different facilities. Um, advanced care planning is also highly focused on forms, meaning that, uh, and this is no surprise to Carla and myself, as we were going through our training, it was sort of like you, you hit the gold bucket if you got the 
you know, DNR, meaning you got someone to announce that they were a do not resuscitate status. Um, so it become, became very focused on, you know, let's complete and sign off on this document um, without really understanding what goes into discussing the issues that are conveyed in these documents. So overall, you know, these advanced care planning discussions uh, were uh, very poor in communication and it resulted in individuals who have become incapacitated receiving care that is really not the care that they desired. The process for advanced care planning discussions in general had been very poorly defined and we're starting to thankfully see this change um, with work that some of our colleagues are doing and other individuals uh, around the country. Uh, but in general, people didn't know how to counsel about advanced care planning and how to correctly document what their wishes were. So uh, this is what the state is uh, of advanced care planning in Oregon. Um, is anyone familiar with this booklet? I think it's what's handed out in Benton County. I don't know if, if, if it's sort of universal, but this is an example of Oregon's advanced care planning document. Now, there are uh, states in which you can fill out pretty much one of any variety of advanced care templates. In Oregon, we have legal language um, which, is, which gives us one document that we can use, or basically one type of language that can be used in advanced care planning. This is an example of one of them. The Oregon Advanced Directive says that this is a legal document that allows you to express your wishes for end-of-life care. And if you look inside this Oregon Advanced Directive booklet, this is a sentence directly from the booklet which says, the advanced directive covers only healthcare decisions. It has no effect over your financial affairs or medical insurance. And I want you to keep that in mind as I go through the rest of this talk. Okay. So there are a lot of really great things about the Oregon advanced directive booklet. Um, for instance, it prompts discussions about whether someone wants to have life-prolonging measures. It prompts discussion about things such as CPR, resuscitation, or breathing machines, ventilators. It asks people to consider whether or not they would want artificial nutrition and about organ donation. And it prompts conversation about whether in different circumstances, someone would want curative versus palliative care. Palliative care meaning the type of care when someone wants the focus of their care to be mostly on comfort uh, in the face of a serious or life-limiting illness. It prompts conversation about pain management, and most importantly, the Oregon Advanced Directive prompts individuals to identify a healthcare representative, someone who would make decisions for them if they lost capacity to do so. Now, all of these things here, I don't know if there's a pointer, let me see if there's a pointer. Um, all of these issues are certainly very important to consider. But what I would like to propose is that we take a different approach to, to advanced care planning, which is to think a little bit more comprehensively. First of all, that these forms, whether it's the Oregon Advanced Directive Booklet or if you're in another state, some other advanced directive, maybe even the Physician Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment, the pink form that has become um, very ubiquitous, um, these are springboards for conversation. So what these are, are um, they should be triggers for ongoing activity that focuses on communication and not specifically the forms. Really in context, these forms are just the icing on the cake. You complete the forms only after you've had a thorough and, um, uh, and well thought out uh, discussion with whoever you've identified. It emphasizes surrogate preparation. So when I encourage individuals to think about advanced care planning as something beyond just filling out the form, what we mean is that the surrogate that you have identified is going to be called upon to make decisions for you that are other than just end-of-life decisions. You know, things such as resuscitation, no resuscitation. Um, what we have found is that surrogates who are called upon to make healthcare decisions 
are now having to make decisions about a whole host of things, whether someone has different medical interventions, even where someone may go for rehabilitative services after they leave a hospital. So these forms, which only give you some check boxes about whether or not you want CPR or no CPR or artificial nutrition, are inadequate to inform your surrogate decision maker what you might want in different circumstances. And so what we are recommending is that people talk about their goals of care. You know, what is the the reasonable quality of life that you would want, uh, which Patrick alluded to in terms of giving your life meaning and giving you a sense of value. Um, what are the relationships that you have that are important? And what are the cultural, spiritual, and ethnic values that you hold dearly that are the things that you want your surrogate decision maker to weigh when they are called upon to make medical decisions on your behalf? It's also important that um, surrogates take into account the socioeconomic realities of your, of your condition, as well as the socioeconomic determinants of health um, that everyone faces. So what comprises comprehensive advanced care planning? Before we can answer that, I think we need to start by asking, does traditional advanced care planning miss the big picture? So I've described the Oregon Advanced Directive form for you, which focuses on end-of-life care. But we now know that most individuals in the United States which age with chronic illnesses or perhaps suffer a catastrophic uh, illness uh, later in life are going to live with many years of disability long before end-of-life. And so we are talking about many years of individuals potentially having cognitive incapacity where a surrogate decision maker may need to be making decisions throughout that period of time, not just at the end of life. And so the, the decisions that an individual who is a healthcare decision maker may need to make might include issues about personal care, long-term care, and we need to begin pulling in other types of decision makers could be the same person, um, but legally they're often uh, stratified, to be making the issues of socioeconomic decisions. So this might include issues about financial security, financial transactions, your housing, where you live, where you need to move to to be adequately cared for. And hopefully this diagram looks familiar from Carla's presentation, but it's also about looking at your um, social dynamics and your relationships, as well as potential caregiver stresses that may arise if you are depending on um, non-professional caregivers for your care. So what I like to talk about is moving advanced care planning upstream. So on the left, this is kind of how the Dying in America report um, describes advanced care planning. And on the right is what we are promoting as comprehensive advanced care planning. So, the current advanced care planning um, tends to focus primarily on medical decisions and particularly end of life decisions. And we want to start talking about not just medical decisions, but legal, financial, psychosocial, uh, and environmental issues that impact a patient. The scope of advanced care planning, which has always been uh, focused on end of life care, we want to now describe as something that must incorporate not just end-of-life care, but long-term care issues, especially related to individuals who are having functional impairments and need assistance with their day-to-day -day activities. The setting for having discussions about advanced care planning also needs to move forward, meaning that historically it's tended to focus greatly on the acute care setting, asking someone in the hospital when they've become ill, um, you know, who do you want to make decisions for you? In reality, we need to move it far further upstream and have these discussions long before someone has lost capacity. And also when someone has a diagnosis right from the beginning when they have a diagnosis of a potentially chronic, progressive, or debilitating illness. The discussions that we have for advanced care planning also needs to include not just patients and clinicians, but clinical and non-clinical providers, such as financial advisors or legal services providers. 
And this is the only way that we can take an interdisciplinary approach to optimize a patient's resources to improve decision making and their future care environment. So we know that health and well-being don't exist solely in a medical bubble. And that's what Carla described for you earlier in that as geriatricians, we know that you know, high blood pressure, diabetes is only one tiny aspect of an older adult's well-being. We know that things such as your functional status, your financial state, your residential and your social uh, state are very much bi-directionally involved with whether or not you perceive a good well-being and even whether you perceive loneliness. So these types of factors, if you have an impairment in any one of these, they can contribute to having a poor sense of well-being and vice versa. If you feel lonely or if you have a poor sense of well-being, you might develop impairments in any of these issues. So I'd like to move now to explore the intersection between advanced care planning and loneliness specifically. This is an article by Paula Spann um, called The Patients Were Saved and That's Why the Families Are Suing. Okay. So comprehensive advanced care planning. Comprehensive advanced care planning um, really requires engagement in sort of, you can think of two different time points. One is that it involves engagement and discussion while an individual still has capacity, but the reason why it's important is that it is invoked or it becomes active after a patient has, or individual, has lost capacity. So we know that planning ahead can reduce different risk factors such as stressors about one's future um, care situation, someone's financial security, their housing situation, and that these are certainly issues that can uh, contribute to a sense of loneliness. After someone has lost capacity, so. we know that loneliness can still be experienced by an individual who, despite not being able to make their own financial or medical decisions, may still feel um, that they are socially isolated um, or don't have the social relationships that they would, would like. There was a question earlier during um, Carla's Q&A about um, dementia and Alzheimer's disease and feeling loneliness. And it's a misconception, as I'm sure you all know, that someone who has dementia cannot feel lonely. So just because someone has lost the cognitive ability to be able to handle complex decision making, we know very well that individuals who have dementia and impaired cognition can still feel lonely, still want social relationships and engagement with other individuals individuals. So we know that living alone is not the same as loneliness, and Carla defined that really clearly for us. Um, but I do want to touch on some predictors of loneliness within the literature. So living alone does certainly increase one's risk for having future loneliness, as well as having a worsening of one's baseline anxiety or depression and having a decline in vision or a decline in function. Now, the key points here that I want to emphasize is that these are changes in condition, meaning that someone who has, for instance, been blind their whole life versus someone who has their vision but then loses their vision later on in life. It's that change and that loss of a uh, sensory ability or, um, or change in one's anxiety and depression levels that can contribute to feelings of loneliness. Distress about decline in social involvement. And so someone else uh, in the audience earlier touched upon um, you know, going to lots of funerals, losing one's social network. Um, so not just losing a spouse, but relatives, friends, um, coworkers that, that you had perhaps worked with for many, many years. And finally, financial stress, um, having a poor income or self-perceived uh, financial stressors can also be predictive of future loneliness. Some protective factors, um, as you can imagine, kind of the flip side of what we just discussed, is that living with someone um, and having a caregiver who lives in the same household as you can be protective of loneliness. 
maintaining functional independence and mobility can also impact loneliness. Having greater wealth or at least a self-perceived financial security um, can be protective. And frequent participation in social activi activities, such as volunteer work, sports, clubs, etc. Now, these things aren't magic bullets. They don't keep you from getting lonely. Uh, as we heard earlier this morning, you could well be uh, living with your spouse and still feel lonely. Um, but these are some of the factors that, at least in studies that have looked at loneliness, seem to be protective. So, so we know, as Carla mentioned, that loneliness can be dynamic, meaning that an individual can move into a state of loneliness and then come out of that feeling of loneliness. And so, um, you know, part of why I'm discussing about comprehensive advanced care planning is that we can aim to improve the factors that contribute to someone's loneliness and that this might help reduce the, the feelings of loneliness. Oops. So by helping someone to plan ahead for their future, this can enable someone to optimize their future environment and socioeconomic condition and planning ahead enables whoever you've appointed as your surrogate decision maker to be better informed about your wishes and to be able to better address the modifiable factors that might contribute to loneliness when they are called upon to act on your behalf. So some considerations um, about surrogate decision makers. First of all, surrogates can't make informed decisions for you if they have no idea about your values, goals, and preferences. So as I mentioned before, the Oregon Advanced Directive, as many advanced directives are, have a lot of areas for a sort of check boxes where you state whether or not you want resuscitation, you don't want resuscitation. But we know that when someone is called upon to make a whole host of decisions, you're never going to be able to document, yes, I would want surgery in this particular situation if it was this type of broken bone, but not that type of broken bone. I'm sort of speaking in jest, but the point is that we can never anticipate all of the possible scenarios that may come up in someone's health. And so by telling someone and sharing with them what your wishes are, what your values are, what is important for you to have in terms of your quality of life, you can give someone better tools to help make decisions on your behalf. It's also important to recognize that a surrogate decision maker may be called upon to make decisions on your behalf for a temporary period of time during an acute illness when, say, after a surgery, potentially you are uh, in the intensive care unit recovering um, or you have an illness that um, takes away your capacity to make decisions for, say, a week or two weeks, but then you are able to recover and resume your own decision making. Surrogates are also called upon not just for sort of medical decision making in terms of, you know, does this person want a blood transfusion or surgery, but also, as I mentioned earlier, where you might go after hospitalization. Do you go to a skilled nursing rehabilitative program? Do you go to acute rehab? Do you go home with home health uh, nursing and physical therapy services? As you'll remember from that slide I showed earlier with the Oregon Advanced Healthcare Directive, it was very clear from that document that the healthcare proxy um, makes decisions for your medical affairs, but that the healthcare proxy cannot access your funds to arrange care and socialization needs. This comes out of the Oregon statutes. A healthcare representative is not personally responsible for the cost of healthcare provided to the principal, the individual, solely because the healthcare representative makes healthcare decisions for the, the, what they call the principal. Now, to translate this and take it out of legal lease, what this says is that basically, if you appoint a healthcare decision maker, your healthcare decision maker, yes, can make healthcare decisions on your behalf, but they cannot actually pay for your health care if you have bills from your medical uh, services and interventions. They can't sign you into or enroll you in a home health agency if that home health agency needs a legally, uh, ne legally recognized 
uh, surrogate to sign papers for you. And so it doesn't matter if you have a healthcare proxy, um, if you have healthcare needs that are going to involve the need for legal and financial issues. So what are different ways that an individual can identify someone to manage a state and financial affairs? So powerful, power of attorney contracts are useful regardless of one's income or assets. And I frequently get the question or the statement, you know, I don't need to fill out a power of attorney. I don't need to deal with a will or a trust because, you know, I'm... I'm very low income, I don't have really any savings, and that is a complete misconception. Um, it's important to have these types of documents for the very reasons I just explained, which is that medical decisions alone often end up requiring a legal surrogate to help with the other side of um, medical and healthcare issues, which is the financial and the um, legal recognized uh, signatory. Power of attorney agents serve during your lifetime, usually upon incapacity, although there are individuals who may grant power of attorney rights to individuals such as a, a child or a spouse um, before they lose capacity. And that power uh, that is granted to that agent ends upon your death. Other types of contracts are things such as living trusts, which can hold your assets um, and, and manage them so that they're available to you for issues that you may need during your lifetime, um, but then they're also managed after your death and given to you know, whatever beneficiaries you may have designated. Trustees for trusts serve not just during your lifetime, but also after your death. Now, an individual may choose to have their healthcare proxy be the same person as their power of attorney agent. Um, if that's the case, that's great, and they should know what you want. In some situations, those uh, roles are taken on by two different individuals, which is completely fine, but you really want to make sure that those two individuals get along, that they share the same idea of what your values and beliefs are, and that they are on the same page uh, regarding your wishes. So even though your financial power of attorney may not be making medical decisions for you, it can be a bit problematic if your healthcare proxy thinks that what you want at your end of life is to have comfort-focused care, and your financial power of attorney doesn't agree and thinks that you should have full, you know, full core press with ICU and me mechanical ventilators, et cetera. So you want to be sure that if you have two different individuals or more than two individuals serving as your various uh, legal surrogates, that they get along and understand what your wishes are. Now, powers of attorney agents or trustees um, can manage and use funds toward, toward any aspect of your care, assuming you didn't limit their powers. So in terms of someone's well-being, uh, in addition to medical issues, these agents can now arrange for your in-home care providers. They can arrange for your socialization needs. You know, for instance, if you needed to go to an adult day center for socialization and meals. They can also arrange to help you move to a residence that can provide a higher level of care. So all of these issues are particularly salient to individuals who are beginning to lose functional capacity and need help with their day-to-day -day activities, as well as for individuals who, depending on the setting, may experience more loneliness uh, if they had those, than if they had those settings modified. Now, I get the question sometimes, you know, well, I don't really need a power of attorney. Can't I just do a joint bank account? There's pros and cons to that. So the pros are, yes, it is extremely quick and much more convenient to set up a joint bank account, say, between uh, an individual and their adult child. This can enable the account holders, the joint account holders, to pull together their funds towards shared goals. Um, and it can allow those individuals to reach thresholds for certain account features, so perhaps a higher interest rate, uh, maybe free checking, uh, you know, different banking features that might have a higher uh, monetary threshold. The cons, however, are that, as you can imagine, once you have a joint bank account, this allows funds to be withdrawn by any one person on that joint bank account. 
And that means that this account is now vulnerable to any debts or creditors that any individual on that joint account holds. Now, it, it may be that you trust your daughter fully, um, but if that daughter suddenly loses, um, um, loses her job, loses her home, now has a mortgage that she can't pay, um, and develops a debt, the funds that you have in that joint account, even if they were your lifetime savings, can be taken over by the creditors um, that are related to your daughter or whoever is on your joint account's um, debt. Combined assets in joint bank accounts can also potentially impact eligibility for things such as Medicaid or Social Security. So, Putting together a joint bank account, yes, has advantages, but it comes with a lot of risk. And if you are to choose a joint bank account, you really want to have significant trust uh, in, in the person that you've identified to share that account with. Okay. So some other considerations. This came up uh, earlier during the discussion, both with Carla and with Patrick, which is to say that when individuals spell out their advanced healthcare directive and their powers of attorney documents, uh, we often recommend you know, writing the things that you think would be sort of a, um, a line which you would not be willing to cross. You know, for instance, on the medical side, you know, it, some individuals will say, in no circumstance do I want uh, dialysis or CPR. And there are many individuals who will write in their legal documents, under no circumstance do I want to leave my home. You know, I want to live and die in my home. Um, now, that is sometimes not always the best arrangement as you get older and you have frailties or physical cognitive disabilities. Um, so it's really important that as we counsel individuals to prepare their advanced care planning documents that we allow surrogates to have some leeway um, to sort of shackle them with, I don't ever want to leave my home. Um, sometimes puts them in a difficult position of then later feeling, I, I feel like this is not the best situation for my mom, but my mom said she always wanted to live and die in her home, and yet I am not sure that this is safe or appropriate for her. And it causes tremendous guilt on the person who is the surrogate on trying to decide whether or not to continue with that. On the flip side, um, as also was brought up this morning, some individuals may want to move their relative you know, to, to their town to live closer, um, to be uh, near a particular family member. But this can also have variable consequences. So if someone uh, as an older adult has a well-established social network in their hometown, they have activities that they go to, um, you know, even if this is when they have developed dementia, they go to a, a senior member memory care center, which uh, is where they recognize other individuals, they recognize a staff, and now you're going to take this individual and move them to another town, this can have negative consequences for them that you haven't anticipated, even if it means being closer to the surrogate decision maker uh, who you know, would like to, to have that individual closer for, um, for ease of decision making. The other misconception that individuals have is that, um, I, I can't overemphasize that there is no formal oversight over healthcare proxies, over power of attorney agents and trustees, and so selecting someone that you trust and having discussions with them before you lose your capacity can minimize the risk of exploitation and abuse as well as from surrogates um, making decisions that may not have gone in line with what you actually would have wanted. So comprehensive advanced care planning discussion should happen early, thoughtfully, and with a lot of discussion, a lot of discussion and deliberation. There can be risks to identifying a power of attorney agent. So it's certainly um, not a foolproof way uh, to avoid um, exploitation or having something bad happen. But with, without thoughtfully designating surrogates, individuals, I think, are at greater risk of exploitation. Um, 
And what I mean by that is that without a power of attorney of finance, you're more at risk of things such as consumer fraud that targets older adults. And with a power of attorney agent, but one that you have not uh, identified um, and spoken to and one that you may not uh, recognize as trustworthy or not, there can be malicious surrogates who uh, can misuse a person's assets. So the intersection between loneliness and abuse is something that we need to pay attention to because both perceived loneliness and low social support increase one's risk of being abused or exploited because as you can imagine, people who are lonely or have perceived low social supports, they are wanting human connection and they are wanting relationships. And this allows a tremendous open door to individuals who are out there for malicious reasons to try to um, you know, get someone to buy into your stocks or to invest in your new company or to buy supplements that are going to, you know, help you live long and well when all of these things really may just be financial ploys um, to take advantage of older adults and their desire for human relationships. One in ten older adults uh, is the victim of some type of abuse, neglect, or exploitation. And three to five percent of that is financial. When you talk about individuals with dementia, it is almost one in two. Now the challenge is that when someone has lost their assets through financial exploitation, these assets are often not recoverable. Whoever has made off with the money oftentimes has already spent it or has gone on, um, you know, is not, uh, found, cannot be found or, or uh, the prosecution is very challenging. Individuals who experience abuse, neglect, or financial mistreatment uh, have an increased risk of later loneliness. Many individuals, especially older adults who are victims of this type of um, uh, activity, become very gun-shy of relationships, can become very gun-shy of, um, of, of reaching out and can withdraw into their homes, and that can certainly contribute to future loneliness. I should say also that in terms of lost assets, uh, most older adults live on fixed incomes. And so when you lose a significant proportion of your savings or your monthly income, that has a significant impact on an older adult's financial well-being. So although we don't have statistics on the proportion of adults experiencing loneliness, who have identified and appointed decision-making surrogates. We do know that both social isolation and not having someone who could serve as a reliable surrogate are barriers to the completion of advanced care planning. Okay. So that leads me to um, my last topic, which is the care of unbefriended, or what I call unrepresented adults. Before I go on to that, I want to circle back to the case that I described earlier. So this woman that I, that I had taken care of as a resident showed up in my practice now that I was uh, a, a practicing provider in a geriatrics clinic. As I mentioned, she had had a catastrophic stroke. She came in with two women who I'd never met before uh, when I had taken care of her previously. Um, one was her neighbor. The other one was a woman who had worked for Meals on Wheels and delivered meals to her. Now, this uh, patient, as I mentioned, had uh, no ability to speak um, and, as best we could tell, was cognitively unable to give any direction about the care that she would want. Now, when I had taken care of her as a resident, you know, I and our social worker had thought we had done our due diligence. We set her up with Meals on Wheels um, because she wasn't great at cooking and had been losing some weight, but otherwise was doing okay. Um, and what I then found out when I took care of her again uh, as a provider was that uh, she had um, uh, prepared her advanced care planning document. She had an advanced health care directive as well as a power of attorney um, document and she had named her neighbor and she had named this woman who delivered Meals on Wheels to her. These women had no idea she had named them in her documents. They had never had any discussions with her about what her wishes were. In fact, uh, they weren't 
even aware that she had had a catastrophic stroke until she came home um, and the social workers from the hospital had reached out through Meals on Wheels and, and her neighbors to try to find out you know, what was the situation with this patient. Um, now these two ladies, out of the goodness of their heart, really tried their best to serve as her surrogates, um, one as the healthcare direct uh, agent and the other to manage her finances. Um, but her care was very challenging. You know, after her stroke, she had a lot of sort of yelling and screaming behavior, and and they were not um, familiar with what it meant to take care of someone who had you know vascular issues and uh, vascular dementia. And they tried their best, but ultimately, after about a year. Both of them were extremely burned out, and they said, you know, I, I am not sure that I can continue to do this. And so uh, within the space of about two months, uh, we realized that, uh, you know, as much as these two women, out of the goodness of their hearts, had been trying to make decisions um, and provide care for this woman, uh, they were not going to continue in this role, and we were now faced with having to find, uh, in California, what is called a conservator. Uh, which is like a public garden, except that this woman had the funds to, to pay for it. So, you know, I bring this case up because one, it was a lightning bolt to me to realize that, you know, I thought I was being a really good doctor when I was a resident and taking care of this woman, and only to find out that I had completely missed something incredibly critical to this woman's health care, which was that she had nobody to represent her um, after the loss of these individuals who, in reality, um, really had no idea how to make decisions for her based on what she might have wanted because they didn't know what she would have wanted. So unbefriended adults. Personally, I don't like this term, um, but it is the term that is used by the American Bar Association. Um, and what it refers to are adults without capacity to give informed consent for treatment and who have no advanced directive nor any family, friends, or legally authorized surrogate to be invo involved in decision making. My preference is to use the term unrepresented adults but uh, you'll see in the legal documents that unbefriended is the, the common term. Now this is, is a statement that comes out of the American Bar Association's Human Rights Magazine, which is describing these unrepresented adults as the most vulnerable population. The single greatest category of problems we encounter are those that address the care of decisionally incapable patients who have no living relative or friend who can be involved in the decision-making process. These are the most vulnerable patients because no one cares deeply if they live or die. So what is the state of care for unrepresented adults in Oregon? Oregon has a significant and largely unaddressed health and human rights crisis. This is from a report in 2012. In that report, it identified that there were anywhere from about 1,500 to 3,200 Oregonians uh, who needed representation but did not have anyone to represent their needs. Uh, so these are individuals who do not have uh, some family member, a friend, uh, or a public guardian uh, to help them with decision making. That 2012 report helped spawn the opening of the Oregon Public Guardian Office in 2014. And I will say, having come from California where we had an established public guardianship office, granted it's not perfect, I was shocked to hear that Oregon had only established its public guardian office three years ago. Oregon has relied on a legal statute called the Hierarchy of Decision Making. And what this statute says is that uh, it allows decision making that is limited to withdrawal or withholding of life-sustaining procedures for someone with a terminal condition, permanent unconsciousness, or progressive advanced illness, um, to have decision making made by a hierarchy of individuals that are listed in the, the law books, starting with spouse, and if you don't have a spouse, an adult designee who's been previously identified, an adult child, a parent, a sibling, so on so forth, so forth down to attending physician, meaning the physician in the hospital who is caring for you in this end of life uh, time period. 
Now there's limitations to this Oregon hierarchy. Similar to the Advanced Healthcare Directive, it only addresses life support measures and does not address any other medical consent needs. The surrogate in that hierarchy list has to, of course, be willing to make decisions on an individual's behalf. There is no requirement for providers, physicians, or advanced practice clinicians to assess a surrogate's competence, biases, or understanding of ethical decision-making principles. So an incapacitated adult may end up with decisions made by a re remote relative or friend who perhaps had no idea what that individual would have wanted, moreover, may not have even a strong interest in uh, sort of doing what the individual may have wanted. And so it really, for me, I think, um, makes explicit the vulnerabilities of loneliness if that loneliness was also compounded by someone not having their advanced care planning documents. Because we know that loneliness is correlated with functional impairment and declining health, um, that these things increase as someone becomes incapacitated. Lonely adults are often unrecognized and unseen to begin with, and now you compound the fact that a lonely adult may develop a medical uh, illness which leaves them incapacitated. And they are now suffering the greatest vulnerability if they don't have previously an appointed trusted surrogate. These individuals are now not only unseen, but completely voiceless. So what I hope to have I've shown within this sort of talk about comprehensive advanced care planning is that we can address factors contributing to loneliness now and I think that these are important discussions for us to have within this forum about the types of interventions such as the friendship line, um, outreach and art therapy, music therapy to address loneliness in our uh, population now. But we also need to be preparing our older adults, our middle-aged adults, our younger adults to prepare for their futures to optimize their well-being in the future. And we can do this by counseling all adults to choose trustworthy and reliable surrogates. In some cases, uh, for older adults, this may not be your spouse. And I know that can sound harsh, but this is not personal. If you have a spouse who is prone to depression or anxiety or is, has a difficult time making a decision on your behalf um, because they are so personally invested that they can't separate what you would want from what they would want, that may not be the appropriate decision maker. You want to counsel adults to discuss their future care wishes with the individuals that they've identified. And we want to encourage all adults to complete both advanced health care directives, but also financial and estate planning documents, because in our society and in our communities, it is these latter documents that are what enable someone to handle all of the other issues that sometimes a health care agent uh, is limited from doing. So my take home points, comprehensive advanced care planning includes discussion and documentation of preferences regarding one's social, financial, and health status, not just end of life care issues. Loneliness and social isolation may impede completion of comprehensive advanced care plans. And lacking thoughtfully designated health care proxies or financial surrogates puts individuals at risk of abuse, exploitation, and decision making by others that may not be in line with what they wanted. And these vulnerabilities from abuse or exploitation can contribute to downstream loneliness. And finally, that thoughtfully completed comprehensive advanced care planning may protect an individual from downstream, downstream ill health, including loneliness. Thank you. Mm -hmm.